Good afternoon and welcome to the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty's webinar on Next Steps in Bringing Home the Human Right to Housing, uh, featuring scholarship from the Symposium on the Human Right to Housing that was held last April, almost exactly a year ago, um, uh, in conjunction with Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute, then the Northeastern School, University School of Law's Program on Human Rights in the Global Economy, and the Columbia Law School Human Rights Law uh, Review. Uh, we're excited to be here today. We have a packed webinar full of great presenters. Um, and uh, the full edition of the symposium edition of the Human Rights Law Review is available on our website at nlchp.org. Um, and you can see the full link at, on your screen right now. Uh, thanks to the uh, editors of the Law Review, we've been able to make this edition available for free uh, in full and PDF on our website, so you don't even need to go through a paid service to access the articles. Uh, today we have a wide range of expertise represented on the call, um, ranging from uh, several members of the Law Center staff, um, ACLU of Southern California, uh, Columbia's Human Rights Institute, Legal Action of Wisconsin, uh, uh, Northeastern's uh, Program on Human Rights in the Global Economy, and the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative. I won't go into detail on the presenters' bios. Those are all available in the law review itself, um, just in the interest of time. Uh, today, we'll give a, a little bit of context of where we are coming uh, from and where we are going to in the movement for the human right to housing and how this uh, specific uh, uh, law review plays into that larger movement. Um, then we'll discuss each of the articles in turn, uh, spending about five to seven minutes on each article. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. Uh, all the attendees will be muted throughout the uh, presentations. If you have any questions, you can type them into either the, the question or the chat box um, on your GoToWebinar side panel, which you should be able to access by clicking the little plus button next to the questions. And uh, you can type in there, and we will answer those questions. They'll be read aloud, and then we can forward them to the proper respondents um, at the end of the presentation. I'll, I'll give a reminder on how to ask questions at the end of the presentation again. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to invite our Executive Director, Maria Pastorinas, to give a little bit of the, the background and context on why we are here together on this webinar today. Thank you, Eric. Um, many years ago, I helped start a legal clinic at a shelter in Washington, D.C. And you can see the um, before and after shots of me at the legal clinic then, which was quite a few years ago, and you can tell by the intervening change in hair color in the next picture, which is a shot of me at our symposium last year. Um, this is important because I think it sets the, the context for why it's so urgent for us to work for the human right to housing. At the shelter back then, um, we set up a table in the hallway with a handwritten sign that said legal clinic. And somewhat to my surprise, many people came. Some had straightforward legal issues, like an eviction that seemed unfair that I could advise on. But others, and others just wanted someone to, to talk to who might be sympathetic. But many said, I need a place to live, and I can't afford one. Or I'm on the waiting list for public housing. Where do I go in the meantime? Or I need a job. And these were problems that shelter residents brought to our legal clinic and expected that a lawyer might be able to help with. There wasn't much I could say, however. I might be able to make a few practical suggestions. I might be able to cobble together some legal strategies to help get some public assistance or get on the waiting list for housing. But as a lawyer, there was not much I could do directly to address these most urgent concerns. 
So a few years later, I was at a UN conference on the human right to housing, along with a small group of US advocates working on homelessness and poverty. And the discussion there was all about exactly the issues that concern us most. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says that everybody has a right to an adequate standard of living, including housing. Subsequent treaties and guidance that spell out exactly what the human right to housing means and practice, such as affordability, secure tenure, accessibility. So here was a body of law that took these issues seriously, addressed them directly and specifically. But as a US trained lawyer, I was skeptical. Sure, this human rights stuff sounds great, but what can I really do with it? Surely I can't just walk into court and argue on behalf of homeless clients that they have a right to housing and expect them to get a home. So we embarked on research, investigation, and pilot projects. Well, it turns out that we can use human rights in the US legal system. But we can't just walk into court on behalf of a homeless client and assert his human right to housing, at least not yet. But we can use human rights law and strategies in important and very impactful ways. And in fact, we're doing so to change federal policy, to make state and local legislative and policy change, and to support domestic art legal arguments and litigation. In fact, just last month, the UN Human Rights Committee concluded its review of US compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And following much advocacy by the Law Center, the criminalization of homelessness became one of the focus areas of the review. The committee recommended that the US abolish criminalization and implement solutions to homelessness in line with human rights standards. Now we're working with HUD to use its federal funding power to encourage communities to stop criminalization. And this is a direct result of our, our taking part in the UN process. And this is just one example of how we're using human rights to advance our goals. And I know that other advocates and organizations are also adopting human rights strategies. Our symposium last year highlighted many of them and the special issue of the Columbia Human Rights Law Review that came out of that um, and is, that is the focus of this webinar delves more deeply into a few of them. The need is especially urgent now as homelessness grows and as inequality widens. At the same time, momentum for human rights at home is building. The Law Center's goal is to build a strong legal foundation for economic and social rights and in particular the human right to housing which is pivotal to those rights, as well as to many others. But ultimately, I want to have an answer as a lawyer for a homeless person who simply needs a safe, decent, affordable place to, to live. Now I'll turn it over back to Eric to outline an approach, um, to introduce the approach discussed in our article for the review. Thanks, Maria. So, our article is about remedies. Um, basically, we at the Law Center have a problem, which I think will sound familiar to many people working um, in the legal services um, uh, and legal advocacy field. We, uh, this problem looks like this. Communities have homeless people in them because of these economic policies that Maria was mentioning. Uh, communities will turn to criminalization to address homelessness because it appears to be a low-cost solution that, um, that can get people off the streets quickly. In reality, we have many studies that show it's not that, but uh, nonetheless, commun communities seem to see this as a quick fix. We bring a lawsuit to protect the rights of homeless people um, under the Constitution using uh, human rights arguments. Um, and in many cases, we will win. We will get an injunction against the policy or practice in the community. But all that does is stop the police from arresting people for these basic like behaviors that they have to perform in public because they are homeless. And so communities still perceive there's a problem because people are still homeless. And within a short time, they will come back with a new, slightly modified criminalization approach that they hope is more constitutional. So the only real way to stop this cycle is to actually provide housing to end homelessness rather than trying to simply sweep it under the rug. 
But ordering communities to do so is something that courts uh, have been reluctant to do up to this point. However, we believe not only would such an order be constitutionally appropriate, but it might even be required by evolving international law norms. I'll turn it over to Tristia to talk a little bit more about this problem, and then um, Heather Johnson will talk about our solution, and then I'll finish with a word on the international law point. Tristia? Eric, for the introduction, as Eric mentioned, U.S. courts have recognized that in areas where available shelter space is inadequate to meet the need, homelessness is an involuntary condition, and criminalization violates homeless persons' rights under the U.S. Constitution. And while these court victories are important, their practical impact has been very limited. The remedies offered by domestic courts are usually narrow injunctive relief or small monetary damages awards, and they're inadequate to stop cities from criminalizing homelessness, and they do nothing to address the underlying causes of homelessness. In our article, we discuss four examples of cases where favorable court decisions have still failed to produce the remedies needed to make a difference in the lives of homeless people. The first is the case of Pottinger versus the City of Miami, where a class of homeless plaintiffs brought suit challenging several City of Miami police practices, including the systematic arrest of homeless people for activities they had no choice but to perform outside. While the court found that there were 10 times as many homeless people as available shelter beds, and that the police practices violated Fourth, Eighth, and Fourteenth Amendment rights, the court stopped short of ordering relief that provided what it recognized as the ideal solution, namely ordering that the city provide housing. Instead, the case resulted in a consent decree that merely prohibits certain police practices and requires some enhanced police training. None of what was included in the consent decree, however, has stopped the criminalization of homelessness in Miami. Similarly, in Jones versus the City of Los Angeles, the ACLU successfully challenged an L.A. County ordinance prohibiting sleeping, sitting, or lying down in public. Again, while the court found that the city had unconstitutionally punished people for conduct that was involuntary and inseparable from their homeless status, the case ultimately resulted in moderate change. For example, police were prevented from enforcing the challenge laws during certain hours of the day rather than at all. The relief in this case went somewhat further than Pottinger and that some housing relief was ordered, but the additional housing was minuscule in comparison with the actual need. Awards of monetary damages have also so far been inadequate. In the case of Kincaid versus the city of Fresno, a constitutional challenge was made to the city's practice of performing so-called cleanups where homeless people were moved from encampments on city property and their belongings, including uh, needed medication, photo identification, and priceless keepsakes were destroyed as trash. The court found that the city had violated the constitutional rights of homeless people, but the final outcome of the case, including an award of $2.3 million in monetary damages, only provided very minimal practical relief. The most positive outcome to date is found in the case of Lakewood versus Ocean County, where the court prevented the local government from forcibly vacating a homeless encampment. In that case, the court noted that there is a governmental responsibility to care for the poor and, in its final order, required the government to provide housing or, in the absence of housing, to permit people to continue camping on public property. But even this outcome did not go far enough. The court merely sanctioned the provision of housing assistance. It did not direct it. And also, the government's responsibility to provide housing was limited to a single year. These cases demonstrate that enforcing the limited civil rights protections under the Constitution leave the violation of the human right to housing unaddressed. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Eric. And I will uh, turn it to Heather uh, in turn to, to talk about some of uh, uh, the cases that lead us to believe that a more expansive solution is possible. Wonderful. Thanks, Eric. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, well, as Tristia described, landmark victories challenging the criminalization of homelessness have often been disappointing in terms of the impact felt by homeless individuals. Um, this is due in part to the persistence of local governments pursuing criminalization, um, often only nominally changing ordinances to reflect a judgment, uh, as well as the lack of resources to challenge repeated violations because there's often no right to counsel um, 
when homeless individuals are charged with infractions. Um, ending the repeated enforcement of such ordinances will require significantly stronger remedies, um, such as court oversight of law enforcement departments, um, or even the provision of housing for chronically homeless individuals. Domestic courts have been reluctant to order stronger remedies in criminalization cases because of legitimate separation of powers concerns. Federal courts' remedial powers are typically limited to addressing the specific violations at issue. For instance, enjoining the enforcement of sleeping or camping laws because it, it's the enforcement that violates um, homeless persons' constitutional rights. Um, providing housing would arguably go beyond the, the violations at issue in litigation, um, leaving homeless persons in a better position than they were in um, prior to the, the enforcement of those ordinances. In our article, we argue that domestic legal precedent could support broader structural remedies of the type needed uh, in instances where repeated egregious violations have not been corrected in response to prior court orders. This precedent arises in the context of school desegregation and prison reform cases in which the Supreme Court has allowed lower courts to fashion significantly broader remedies where such remedies are necessary to cure ongoing constitutional violations and where defendants have demonstrated a long-standing unwillingness or inability to cure the violations at issue. For instance, in, in Brown v. Plata, one of the cases discussed in our article, um, this is a challenge centering on the unconstitutional provision of medical and mental health care in California prisons. The Supreme Court upheld a lower court order requiring the state to reduce the size of the prison population to levels that would permit the state to provide the required health care. So, so in that case, um, the violations alleged relate to the inadequate provision of, of health care. Um, the court didn't merely order um, more resources to be devoted to health care to address um, the violations alleged. The court um, because of prior um, litigation regarding the California prisons felt that the, the only way to cure the repeated violation was to order a reduction in the size of the prison population. So we argue that this precedent suggests that broader remedies could eventually be permitted to address repeated instances of, of, of egregious uh, criminalization particularly where um, local governments have shown an unwillingness to, to address the constitutional violations as ordered by a court. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Eric to discuss the international precedent relating to the right to an effective remedy. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Heather. That was great. Um, so international law in both treaties and in the case law of international and regional human rights courts has begun to recognize an affirmative obligation on courts to provide real remedies, not just paper solutions, but orders that actually stop abuses and prevent recurring violations. Uh, this uh, ranges from at the international level. Uh, in 2006, the General Assembly issued its basic principles and guidelines on the right to a remedy and reparations for victims of gross violations of international human rights law, which called this aspect of the right an emerging duty. At the regional level, the Inter-American Court has often issued non-repetition measures, ordering structural changes to remedy violations, and the European Court of Human Rights has more recently begun to follow up on its declaratory relief judgments, and where those judgments have not produced true remedial change, issued further injunctions and maintained oversight over cases. Additionally, at the comparative level, uh, both South African and Indian courts have built on the best aspects of U.S. structural relief jurisprudence and pushed further in creating remedies. For example, India's Supreme Court found repeated violations of India's constitutional prohibition on children working in hazardous employment. And rather than simply issuing another ruling against the practice, it concluded that child labor persisted because of endemic poverty and ordered children relocated into non-hazardous jobs or alternatively ordered the state to pay a ch child's parent 
uh, a monthly stipend as long as their child was in school rather than working. And these addressed the underlying problem, did produce a situation that was better than the, um, the original circumstances of the family, as Heather was saying, but um, ultimately did lead to a decrease in the practice that was uh, found to be a repeated violation. And based on all of this, we believe it's time to push our courts to do more. Even we, if we don't find the human right to housing in our federal or state constitutions, we can promote its recognition and enjoyment as part of the remedy for constitutional violations we do recognize. We believe this model could work well on other issues, and we encourage folks to read the article and be in conversation with us about potential cases. So with that, um, we'll turn it over to our next presenters, um, Risa Kaufman and Heidi Wegleitner on their article on promoting the right to counsel as an aspect of protecting the human right to housing. Risa and Heidi? Great. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. This is Risa. Hi. Wonderful. So first, I just want to thank the co-organizers of this symposium and especially the National Law Center for organizing this webinar. Um, and the Columbia Law School Human Rights Law Review for its work on the publication and also for making it so broadly available. Um, it's really exciting to be able to participate in this. I'm going to talk about our article, The Independence, the Interdependence of Rights, Protecting the Human Right to Housing by Promoting the Right to Counsel, um, which was co-authored by myself, Martha Davis at Northeastern Law School, um, and Heidi Wegleitner at Legal Action of Wisconsin. Um, so Heidi and I will talk about this article together. Um, so our article uses the human rights framework to show the interrelationship between the right to housing and the right to counsel in civil cases. And it discusses the implications of advocacy efforts to link the two. A number of recent studies show that legal representation has a dramatic impact on an individual's ability to secure basic rights and needs. And in our article, we summarize some recent studies across the country that have found that legal representation particularly impacts outcomes in housing court. At the same time, there's a growing recognition by the international community of the impact that legal counsel has on individuals' ability to secure basic human needs, including housing. Human rights treaty bodies um, and independent human rights experts have commented that legal representation is fundamental to safeguarding fair, equal, and meaningful access to the legal system as a whole, and it's also critical to safeguarding other human rights. These experts are increasingly calling on the United States, in particular, to improve access to legal representation, particularly uh, where a lack of counsel has a disproportionate impact on racial, ethnic, and national minorities, and on immigrant communities, and with respect to um, the ability to access basic needs. So there are a number of strategic reasons for um, and ancillary benefits of pairing advocacy for a right to housing with advocacy for a right to counsel, particularly in the US legal context. And we discussed this at greater length in the article, but I'll just summarize them here. So first, US courts, um, as most of us know, are much more comfortable in the realm of due process protections. Um, than they are in the realm of more substantive economic and social rights protections, um, particularly uh, federal courts. So furthering a substantive right to housing through the more procedural right to counsel can take advantage of this institutional capacity and, and reality. Um, the paired strategy also provides opportunities for building new alliances and broadening coalitions. Uh, so for example, it brings together groups that are traditionally concerned with procedural fairness such as bar associations um, and the broader access to justice community into broader advocacy efforts for the right to housing. Um, and in addition, it necessarily requires the recognition um, by courts and, and others of the importance of housing as a component of individual and family well-being. Um, those are the broad scopes of the article. Client stories show in very concrete ways how legal counsel can impact an individual's ability to secure and protect their housing. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my co-author, Heidi, to discuss some of these stories, which we highlight in the article, and also the advocacy efforts by Legal Action of Wisconsin to secure the right to counsel as a means of advancing the right to housing. Heidi? Thanks, Risa, and thanks, Eric, and the Law Center. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. 
Yeah, can you focus? You can. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm a legal services attorney, and um, I expect there are many other legal services attorneys on the call. Um, but another kind of thing that we talk about in, in framing this is the extreme shortage of funding for legal services and um, the huge numbers of people who we need to, who we have to turn away every day because we simply don't have the staff to represent all the folks who really need our help. Um, so there's a huge justice access to justice gap. Um, I'm going to just touch on a few stories that I think illustrate you know, how in sort of everyday run-of-the-mill legal services cases, um, having the representation of counsel who obviously have some expertise in the substantive law and, and uh, civil procedure makes a huge difference for folks in protecting the, the limited number of housing rights that they have. So um, I want First, we can talk about Susan. Um, Susan lived in a mobile home park. Um, and in Wisconsin, mobile home park tenants actually um, have the right to continued tenancy absent good cause for terminating them, which kind of distinguishes them and gives them more protection than other tenants who can be non-renewed um, without good cause. Um, and in Susan's case, uh, she was facing non-renewal, and the park owner didn't allege any good cause requirement under the state law. Um, and because Susan had uh, reached out and, and knew to seek help through um, legal action, legal action was able to get the court to dismiss that case and help her negotiate a new lease to stay. And for Susan, you know, it was even more than just about keeping her home, but it was keeping her independence. She was elderly. She was receiving long-term care to live in her home. She had cats. She liked gardening. So that was really um, an important piece for her human dignity, in addition to obviously keeping her housing. Um, in other cases where we get involved um, to protect the um, substantive and procedural rights of our clients include um, to assert tenant protections in foreclosed properties. Um, we had uh, a client named Karen who um, she had actually been sued by a uh, foreclosed uh, former property owner who was just trying to, you know, extort more money from her. And this person didn't even own the home anymore. It was bank owned, but of course the bank was sort of out of the picture, um, not involved, and I think owned, um, real estate owned and with some company out of California or something. But uh, because Karen, um, luckily, you know, as she was facing a notice of um, eviction from the sheriff um, after it proceeded and, and the um, improper party got an eviction against her, um, was able to reopen the case with the help of an attorney, get the case dismissed because it was um, completely um, inappropriate for this party to be bringing action. She was able to stay there and assert her rights under the federal law protecting tenants at foreclosure. Um, so that was a, a really key piece and gave her the ability to maintain some stability and maintain her um, county job. Of course, um, housing and stability is key to you know, maintaining employment. Um, additionally, we uh, routinely get involved to protect folks who are um, facing uh, termination of subsidized housing benefits where um, usually there are additional procedural rights and substantive rights for those tenants. Um, we had an elderly couple who had significant cognitive disabilities who had been exploited by a family member and were facing um, eviction for an allegation of a drug, um, uh, a drug, drug related criminal activity. Um, when we were able to get involved and intervene, we were able to assert their rights to have an opportunity to cure um, the alleged lease violation, to assert rights under fair housing law, to um, get a reasonable accommodation related to any disabilities um, involved in the grounds for termination, and successfully negotiate um, uh, the ability for them to stay there. The case was thrown out, and they and they were um, renewed as tenants in that subsidized housing. Without that, those that elderly couple would have been um, homeless in a county that doesn't even have a, a homeless shelter. Um, and, and essentially, there's really no available 
affordable housing. Um, there's wait lists everywhere. So that was um, really important to protecting some very vulnerable people. Um, we've also, we also often get involved to protect victims of domestic violence and assert their rights under the Violence Against Women Act and um, uh, Safe Housing Act in the state of Wisconsin um, have done that to successfully um, get back Section 8 vouchers that have been um, improperly taken from victims of domestic violence um, by the perpetrators of violence in a way to be able to reunify the family and protect them. Um, and another key piece to what we do is um, help people with mental health um, disabilities who may be evicted for um, violating housekeeping um, standards, um, helping them keep their housing through intervening, requesting a reasonable accommodation, allowing them time to continue um, to work on getting their um, unit up to code and getting the supportive services necessary to help them, you know, uh, meet the obligations under their lease. So that's just kind of a handful of cases that are, I'm sure, sound familiar to the legal services advocates out there, but really um, kind of reiterate the importance of um, having an attorney to um, represent you in these types of cases when your kind of basic um, human need to, to housing is at stake. Now, Legal Action has been involved in efforts um, to establish a right to counsel um, because of all the numbers of people that we have to turn away because I'm the only attorney and full-time attorney representing folks in nine counties out of our Madison office. So um, we have uh, pursued litigation. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a case that tells us that there is an absolute right to um, counsel in, in all civil cases, but um, we have also pursued um, administrative rulemaking petitions with the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and it filed one in 2010 asking the court to promulgate a rule um, that the court shall provide counsel at public expense where the assistance of counsel is needed to protect the litigants right to basic human needs, including sustenance, shelter, clothing, heat, medical care, safety, and child custody and placement. And then in making that determination um, as to whether counsel is needed, the court may consider the personal characteristics of the litigant, such as age, mental capacity, education, and knowledge of the law and of legal proceedings and the complexity of the case. Um, that petition uh, was you know, there was an uh, administrative conference and hearing, and many people um, throughout the legal community, throughout um, the country came and testified in support. And the only um, uh, opposition was based on cost by, I think, a few, you know, the counties. Um, and unfortunately, it was denied. However, the court, in its opinion, did recognize that there is an inherent authority of the court to appoint counsel. So while they said that, you know, they weren't going to adopt a rule that said they shall provide counsel after making this determination, they said they do, you know, still have that inherent authority. In rendering that opinion, they also recognized that, um, that there were other ways that this potentially could be advanced um, to address the access to justice gap in Wisconsin and talked about judicial education, and um, uh, establishing a pilot project and tracking um, uh, uh, appointments of civil counsel and things like that. Well, in reality, there was um, some judicial education that happened the first year. There was, um, it really fell off the following year in 2013 as well as in 2014. The funding to establish the pilot project through the State Bar of Wisconsin did not come through. So no, despite a lot of work to establish a pilot project, um, that did not materialize. So Legal Action went back in, um, last fall and filed uh, a new petition saying that as a matter of fundamental fairness, um, again, it, invoking the sort of procedural, the, maybe the court's appetite for the procedural fairness of the issue, um, it's 
it's critical that the Supreme Court allocate funds to establish an uh, appointment of counsel pilot project, and that um, the rule is promulgated that recognizes that um, when, you know, when a civil litigant is indigent, the court shall provide counsel at public expense where the assistance of counsel is necessary to ensure a fundamentally fair hearing in a court proceeding which will affect the litigant's basic human needs, um, including those things that were reiterated and the factors to consider in the earlier petition. So that petition is now um, still pending before the court, and it will be considered either later in 2014 or 2015 with sort of a related access to justice commission um, petition. So we're still trying, and as they've said, um, has been quoted, we. Uh, don't, we will not fail until we quit. Um, and so I think it, it's, it's critical to keep pushing these um, different approaches to establish the right to counsel to, in fact, advance the right to housing. Thank you so much, Heidi. That was really fascinating. And thank you, Risa, as well. Uh, next, we'll turn it over to Lucy Williams to talk about some of the exciting jurisprudence that's coming out of South Africa um, protecting the human right to housing. Lucy? Sure, thank you, Eric. Can everyone hear me? We can, thank you. Good, great. Um, well, again, like Risa said, I want to thank both the organizers of the symposium and especially the, the Center for uh, setting up this webinar. I'm delighted to join you. And greetings from Boston, where we had a very emotional and exciting marathon uh, on Monday. Um, my article, as Eric said, focuses on recent South African constitutional and statutory jurisprudence regarding the right to housing. Um, and what I am attempting to do is analyze both the transformative possibilities, but also the doctrinal limitations um, of this South African work that might help us reimagine the U.S. right to housing law. Um, the South African constitutional courts housing rights jurisprudence is more developed than that regarding any other social and economic right contained in the South African Constitution, particularly regarding eviction cases. Um, I address three aspects of major recent South African right to housing cases. The first is the concept of judicially required meaning, what's called meaningful engagement between government entities and individuals threatened with eviction, which often leads to alternative accommodations for those being evicted or sometimes for in situ housing renovations that negate the need for eviction. And that very much connects to the previous discussion because one thing that we found is you absolutely must have very experienced and effective counsel for the meaningful engagement um, to be successful. Um, the second is the prohibition of unfair practices by landlords and tenants under the Rental Housing Act of 1999, and a decision of the South African Constitutional Court not to address these issues by developing the common law, and particularly the common law contracts under the Constitution. Uh, third, I discuss recent developments in the concept of just and equitable eviction under what's called the PI Act, P-I-E, Prevention of Illegal Eviction from an Unlawful Occupation of Land Housing Act. Now, in each of these three areas, I first describe the important ways in which that jurisprudence has benefited poor people. And then I pre uh, present a critical perspective identifying both some issues of concern uh, and also what might be called unintended consequences. And I'm going to, today in my short time, just be able to give you one example. And I'm going to use that third area relating to the Pi Act. Uh, the Pi Act was enacted to give effect to a section of the South African Constitution, Section 26.3, which states that no one may be evicted from their home or have their home demolished without an order of court made after considering all the relevant circumstances, no legislation may permit arbitrary evictions. The PI Act itself requires a court that is considering an eviction to determine whether it is just and equitable. Um, in light of all the relevant circumstances, 
including the rights and needs of the elderly, children, disabled persons, and house households headed by women. Where the occupier has occupied the land for more than six months, the court must consider whether, quote, land has been made available or can reasonably be made available by a municipality or other landowner for the relocation of the unlawful occupier. So, in the case I discuss in the article, it's called Blue Moonlight, a private owner sought to evict 86 individuals from a warehouse uh, in central Johannesburg in order to develop the property. Uh, the occupiers had previously, their, their occupation had previously been legal, they had been paying rent, the current owner had purchased the building knowing that it was occupied, and the occupiers opposed the eviction on the ground that it would render them homeless. The city, Johannesburg, continued, uh, contended that it was bound to provide temporary accommodation only for those that it, the city, relocated. It was not bound to provide temporary accommodation for those evicted by private landowners. The Constitutional Court upheld the eviction, but found that the eviction would not be just and equitable under the Pi Act until the city provided the occupation of the occupiers with temporary accommodation. It allowed the occupiers to stay on the property for five months, during which time the city had to locate the alternative accommodations. In other words, the court found that in circumstances where an eviction of occupiers from private property would render them homeless, the rights of private landowners had to yield to the occupier's right to housing, albeit not indefinitely. Now, obviously this is a victory for poor residents. However, let me raise a concern about the consequences of this form of relief. In effect, the court ordered the city to subsidize a private developer. Developers, under this order, are incentivized to buy up derelict properties, evict people who have been staying on those properties in desperate circumstances for many years, and then seek to make a handsome profit by way of gentrification. No one in this case, not the court nor the progressive bar, even thought about, let alone addressed, the distributive consequences of the decision, which are, in essence, that the city, that is the public taxpayer, is going to absorb the social dislocation cost of economic development, not the developer. Now, it's certainly better for the city to pay these costs than to visit them on the evicted tenants, but I uh, argue in my article that it is ill-advised not to assess some of the costs to the developers. That's only one example which leads to my conclusion that I draw from all of the examples that I use um, that I discuss in the article, which is that as we think about creative ways to reimagine the right to housing, I argue that while the universality and moral force of human rights discourse assists us in giving meaning and content to housing rights by exposing both the social construction of poverty and by shifting the focus from individual fault and dependency to society's responsibility, that human rights discourse alone provides limited analytical assistance in addressing what I call the difficult economic and institutional questions that have to be faced in order to make housing rights a reality. I think the broad principles of human rights take us only so far. I think they take us to the threshold of complicated and vexing questions of economic development, distribution, and redistribution. And I urge responsible ad advocates to not shy away, to simply seek a false sense of security in the purity of human rights um, doctrine, but rather to engage in messy questions of finance, economic growth, social organization, and social administration. All right, Eric, back to you. Really, really fascinating, Lucy. Thank you so much. Um, and last, we'll uh, turn over to Brittany Scott, 
um, to talk about a couple of uh, very, um, very appropriately segueing from Lucy's piece, um, very concrete and the, the messy ways that communities are making the right to housing real uh, for themselves. Brittany? Cool. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm, my name is Brittany, and I work with the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative. And at NESRI, we actually believe that human rights provides a vision and a set of tools, including standards and metrics for progressive reform that speak to universal values and put people's human needs at the center of decision making. Uh, we also believe that to actually embed human rights in our lives, we need a movement led by the people and communities most impacted by human rights violations. So at NESRI, we work in partnership with communities to create change guided by human rights, particularly in education, work, healthcare, and housing. So the three points that I'd like to share from my article come largely from the stories and expertise of NESRI's allies in housing, especially the Los Angeles Community Action Network and the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign. The first point I'd like to make is that... Yep. Brittany, I think we, we had a, a little um, technical difficulty there, and we lost your sound from uh, where you said my first point. <laughs> okay. Good news. Well, my first point was that public policy and state action create homelessness and poverty. Thanks for letting me know, Eric. Um, but for the growing portion of the U.S. population that's struggling to secure basic and decent housing in a neighborhood, with access to good jobs and good schools, the obstacles are structural. Um, since the New Deal, far more public money has been used to guarantee investments in mortgages to essentially underwrite speculation in the housing market than fund housing programs that meet the needs of low-income residents, which has actually only been allowed to exist in a subordinate role disconnected from good jobs and schools. Both public interventions in housing mortgage guarantees, and public housing institutionalized from their inception seg segregationist practices and helped entrench inequities based on race and class. In the last few decades, rather than recognize the impact of exclusionary and inequitable policies, government has placed blame on the people most impacted, and programs that could provide relief, such as public housing, have also been demonized and ultimately starved of funding. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is that the purpose of housing policy should be to secure basic and decent housing for all people and not necessarily to secure investments. Uh, right now, U.S. housing policy is actively dismantling the only housing system in the country truly capable of providing adequate housing to people with the greatest unmet needs. That is our publicly owned rental housing system. We've actually lost, probably at this point, well over 300,000 units um, since the mid-90s and are losing 10,000 more units each year. Uh, why is this happening? Because we've been quick to accept the false equation that public housing causes crime and allow manufactured criminality to disguise a process of forced evictions and re-entrenchment of inequities and segregation often packaged in progressive seeming sound bites. This seed was firmly planted at the Cabrini-Green Public Housing Development in Chicago in the 90s. There are many important lessons to be drawn from a case study of Chicago's public housing, but the main one I'd like to emphasize is that it's not just bulldozers or the invisible hand of the market that moves people, but also forced evictions through government action. By the time the first Cabrini high-rise was torn down, the population was nearly one-third what it was at its peak. At the same time the government was making money available to demolish public housing in Chicago and require only a fraction of new units be reserved for low-income residents, it also introduced new one-strike eviction policies. One-strike evictions provide so much room for discretion that at the end of the day, families can be pushed out of public housing for virtually any reason at all. And this power has been harnessed, not necessarily at sites um, where violence is the worst, but rather correlates extremely well with whenever public housing is bumping up against gentrification and rising real estate values. In my opinion, the consequences of this is best summarized by J.R. Fleming, a former Cabrini resident and founder of the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign, who noted that the city's plan to redevelop Chicago's public housing could be considered a success 
if the metric was forcing poor people off prime real estate and moving them to areas where there are even fewer jobs and transportation options and where crime, gang activity, and schools were worse. What's happening in downtown LA is yet another concrete example of the dire human consequences of housing policy that's not necessarily about meeting housing needs at all. In the midst of what LA's developers and politicians are calling an urban renaissance, the Skid Row community is getting pushed out. 95% of Skid Row residents are extremely low income and a third are homeless. In part, Skid Row is the product of city policy that sought to contain poverty, homeless services, low income housing in one area of the city, but as local businesses seek to capitalize on the influx of wealthier people into the city, the city's approach to Skid Row has shifted. Beginning in 2006, the Safer Cities Initiative has brought an unprecedented concentration of police officers into the community, enforcing rarely used quality of life ordinances, such as, for instance, jaywalking. In the first two years alone, the citation rate in Skid Row was nearly 70 times that of other neighborhoods. Um, community residents uh, in the Skid Row community are living on less than $1,000 a month. Yet, if they can't pay the expensive tickets they receive, uh, arrests can be made, and nearly half of these arrests, um, which have occurred under the program, have led to residents losing subsidized housing and other services. This is not inevitable. There may not be a Band-Aid solution to homelessness and poverty, but this does not dictate the use of punitive policing strategies, nor the all-out abandonment of low-income communities by the government. So this brings me to my last and final point, that to ensure people's needs are central to decision making that impacts their lives, governments need to work with the most impacted communities to end homelessness and poverty. There's a lot under the auspices of community and municipal control that can be done to alleviate human suffering and meet basic needs. Moreover, government is obligated to work with communities in all stages of this process. Participation is both a human right in and of itself and a vital means to creating an accountable and transparent system of housing and development that serves everyone. This was key to the success story of one of the poorest neighborhoods in Boston. The history of Dudley Street it was one of dis systemic discrimination and government neglect that is widely shared by communities across the country. However, in the 80s, the residents of Dudley Street did something fairly unique. They started organizing, they cleaned up the vacant lots in the community, and they flipped planning on its head. They created their own bottom-up comprehensive revitalization plan. History as the only community group in the nation to win the power of eminent domain to acquire vacant land for resident-led development. This is a useful reminder that municipalities have enormous powers that can be harnessed by communities to prevent displacement and meet their needs. Thank you.